Our second scripture reading today comes to us from the very first book in the Bible, from Genesis, chapter 1. Let us listen to God's word as it speaks to us today. Then God said, let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the wild animals of the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, God created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God said, see, I've given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit, and you shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the air and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I've given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw everything that God had made and indeed It was very good. And there was evening and morning the sixth day. We start a four-part series today titled, Who Am I? And so just to start, I thought it would be helpful for us to think about who we're not. And so I asked some of our church members, when have you pretended to be something that you are not? One person said that they had to lie on their work permit. They had to start work early, and so they had to lie about their age. And it didn't catch up to them until they started to get their Social Security card, their Social Security, and they had to prove their birth certificate because the dates didn't match up. Most of the time, it's just a lie of omission. I was out to eat with a couple of people and we were at Sabor at lunchtime and one of the young women was, is about 15 weeks pregnant. You can't really tell, but it was a busy lunch period and we only had a certain amount of time. So she just leaned back and rubbed her stomach and the people that were awaiting just said, of course, <laughs> take the table. It wasn't really a lie, she is pregnant, but it's just a false identity. One of our church members said that she had twins and going to the grocery store was a horrible experience because people would stop and comment on the twins and just getting a gallon of milk took all day. And so she asked a friend of hers whenever she went shopping to go with her and one would take one twin and one would take the other and they pretended they just had one child. Not really a lie, but a sin of omission. Here's another one. I'm going to read it to you. I was chaperoning my older daughter's Myers Park High School band trip to Disney World. It was one of those drive all night on the bus, pull straight into a dock for a one-day cruise, and then drive to Disney World for concerts. There was a strict set of rules for the students, including no alcohol and behavior, good behavior. So a violation meant immediate, you would be immediately sent back to Charlotte at the parents' expense. So we're on the cruise ship, and around lunch, I go into one of the smaller cafes. It's crowded, so I ask if I could sit at the table with a young man and two young women. I didn't know them. They didn't know me. The waiter comes with their drink order. The girls have Cokes, and the young man has a Budweiser. He tips the waiter $5. No experienced drinker tips a waiter $5 for a Bud. My suspicions are aroused, and then he tells us how his grandmother gave him some extra money for the trip. I ask where he's from. He says, Charlotte, North Carolina. And I tell him I hear it's a lovely city. He said he's here on a band trip, and he's never been on a boat before, and he's having a great time. I watch him drink his beer while we talk, and towards the end he asks if I'm on vacation. And I tell him I'm chaperoning a band trip from Myers Park High School. (laughs) This is Mark DeCastrig's story. (laughs) 
Of course, you could imagine that the young man looked like he would pass out, and the girls excused themselves. And I asked him if he believes in second chances, and all he could say is, oh, please, and promises not to break any more rules. I think the best part was that he was spending his grandmother's money on beer. That's when when he lost it. We all have identities that we put on and we assume. Maybe they're false identities that you choose. Maybe they're ones given to you. At this time of year, we go to our closet and we shake out those false identities and get them ready for Thanksgiving dinner or for the holidays because they're roles that we wear in our families. Maybe you are the perfect family and that's the identity you put on. Maybe you're the reliable daughter. Maybe you're the secret keeper, trusted to keep that secret. Maybe you're even the problem child. But that's your role, so you take that identity out of the closet, dust it off, and put it on. Anne Lamont, in her newest book, says, why don't we give up these identities? Maybe because they're gravely limited and they've falsified our lives but because they aren't who we are, but we do like the containment, how they keep us safe, confined, and in ship shape like spandex. When I wear those rolls, I can't feel the air on my skin, but by the same token, I'm not exposed. Families are hard because there are expectations for each of us. But they're hard also because it's our family who knows who we truly are. It's like standing in front of a mirror fully exposed because your family knows everything about you. And yet on those days like Thanksgiving, we pretend and we put on our identities. We wear the roles that are expected of us. I got a call to make sure I was coming for Thanksgiving dinner and that we'd be staying the whole day. It's going to be a tense year with a broken engagement and a messy divorce, and I know my role. It wasn't said specifically, but I know I'm the circus master. I'm the one that will play some games and bring some joy to the table, and then nobody has to talk about what's really going on in the family. What I really want to do is I want to sit next to this young couple who broke off their engagement and say, how are you? How are you holding up? And it's okay. It's okay. I want to talk to the young woman whose house is on the market after her divorce and a messy affair and say, what's next for you? Are you okay? But I have my role that I'll play, my identity I'll put on, and we'll play some games and we'll laugh and we'll avoid that topic. I don't know if you have those roles in your family. Peacemaker, diplomat, dutiful child, quiet one, loud, cautious. Whatever it is, we put on those roles. Given to us or chosen by us to keep us safe so that we're not exposed and people don't see the darkness and the pain. We learn that from an early age, if you've seen a mother with a stroller and a screaming child, you don't see people rushing right to that mother and thinking, that is amazing. Sometimes we say, I remember those days as we walk away. (laughs) But if you see a father holding a baby who's smiling and laughing, one by one, people come over and remind that child that's the role they want them to play. That's a good role. Laughter, smiles, and it begins there. And it continues throughout our life when people affirm us and we think that's who we are. We pull out our gifts and abilities that God has given us and we put them on and people celebrate that until we begin to think that's who we are. If you ask any young person, introduce yourself to a young person, they'll probably tell you what school they go to and what sport they play. That's their identity. If you ask any adult, 
The adults will tell you what job they have or maybe who's in their family. Our identities are strong. Our schools, our work, our sports. Those identities we put on are strong until they're not. Until we tear our ACL and we can no longer play. Until the fifth concussion and you're told never, ever again set foot on a field. Or the company is restructured and your job changes or you retire and you wonder, who am I? Who am I? I remember asking that question when I was young, sitting under a willow tree in our front yard. I was probably eight or nine. And I remember just pulling my skin and thinking, who am I? What is this? How does this happen? It's not the last time I would ask that question. Who am I? We ask that question of ourselves. And sometimes we walk by the mirror and we see beyond our image to disappointment or somebody who doesn't live up to who they're supposed to be. Maybe you look in the mirror and you see yourself as others see you and you think nobody sees who I really am and that gets frustrating and we forget that somebody else's opinion of us is really none of our business but we walk by and we see it we see the image and we see disappointment failure maybe you look close and you see a lot of stress or not enough sleep that's easy to see what do you see when you look in the mirror What do you hear people tell you as you look? I want you to remember what God sees as God looks at you. A child of God claimed in the waters of baptism, formed in love, held in grace, transformed by the light of Christ. God looks and sees beloved, worthy, enough. Paraphrasing Paul's words in Ephesians, we are the great masterpiece of God. And yet we forget that. And so we come to church and we remember who we are. We come to church and we sit in the pews not just to think about what we've achieved or what we haven't done to perfection, We sit here in the church to remember who we are. We put our feet on the ground and we are in this moment. Maybe we stop and breathe and say just this right now. And as we are in this room, we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses who've reminded us of who we are, who've loved us and to ourselves who've reminded us of the great and immense love of God. We remember that. And we remember the story of God who created the world. God who is an artist who took nothing and made everything. The heavens and the earth, the plants, the animals, the water, the air. And there was only one thing that God made in God's image you and me. In the image of God, we were created. And God breathed God's very breath into us. We are children of God. And God saw all that was created and God said, this is very good. Good. God looked at humanity and said, this is very good. Nadia Belts Weber says that that's an important thing to remember. Not that it's perfect. God didn't say, this is perfection. God said, this is very good. And so a God who created us good doesn't expect perfection from us. 
and we remember this. God didn't say this is very good and thought about aesthetics and thought, you look good. It's theological. Goodness means intention. Very good means these are the people who are going to love like I love. They are going to be goodness in this world as they step out in intention in the world. And yet we forget. We forget who we are. We forget where we are. And most importantly, we forget whose we are. So as we come forward today, remember. Remember who you are, children of God, formed in love, held in grace, transformed by the light of Christ, hope for the world. And when we see that in the mirror, then everything changes. Because we can turn to our neighbor and we could see them and treat them with dignity and humanity. We can turn to our neighbor knowing that we are image bearers of God, sharing God's love in the world. And as we remember, we can go forth no matter where we are, with every race of people, in every synagogue and temple, denomination, political party, and we could look at people and say, you are a child of God, created in love, held in grace, transformed by light, hope for the world. And that changes everything. So as you come forward, remember. Remember who you are and remember that you don't come alone. And that if you have to strip off some identities along the way, that what is underneath may be flawed and may be broken, but it is formed in love and held in grace and hope for the world. Thanks be to God. Amen.